Good evening, everyone. The time is now 7.02 p.m. I'll call the Marion Township Board of Supervisors workshop meeting for February 25th, 2021 to order. Uh, we are doing these meetings through Zoom because of COVID-19 and the, the needs around social distancing and Governor Wolf's emergency declaration stay at home orders. We normally do the Pledge of Allegiance as one of the items as the part the start of the agenda when we're in person, but because of the nature of telepresence, we, we have been omitting that for the time being. The first item on the agenda is to approve the minutes for the January 28th, 2021 Board of Supervisors meeting. I'll motion to approve. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene? Aye. Jim? Aye. Next is to approve the minutes of the February 20th, 2021 workshop meeting. I'll motion to approve. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene? Aye. Jim? Aye. Next is to approve the payment of bills for February, 2021. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay, at this time, I'll open up the floor for public comments. Sue, did we receive anything written or called in there throughout the no week? E no, there were no emails, there were no phone calls. Okay. I know we have a, a number of people from the community on the call. I have the, the mics open for the time being. If anybody would like to make a, a public comment, I'll pause for a few moments if somebody would like to speak up. Otherwise, we'll move on to the, the main items for discussion. Okay. First item on the agenda is we had a, an executive session following the January 28th meeting uh, to discuss property maintenance issues that may result in litigation. That uh, executive session lasted from 8.13 p.m. to 8.39 p.m. And uh, we reached a informed decision and path forward on how to proceed with the, the properties in question. Next item on the agenda is the emergency declaration. We made this back at the March Board of Supervisors meeting in 2020 uh, with a provision to extend a period of time lasting until further action by the board. Uh, we signed that on April 1st and uh, it's my personal opinion that we continue to keep that in place until the immediate threat of COVID has cleared and we no longer face the, the health hazard and uh, danger of having meetings in person. Any comments, Irene or Jim? Oh, 100% agree. Okay. Agreed, yeah. Next item on the agenda, uh, we had a resignation from one of our elected auditors, Bob Nelson. Uh, we made a motion at the workshop to accept his resignation with regret. Peter, excuse and, me, you missed yes. number three. I missed number three? Yep. I That I did. I'm, I apologize, Sue. Um, so uh, I'll finish up on this one and I'll jump right back to that. So uh, we accepted the resignation with regret of Bob Nelson as an elected auditor, and we made a motion to appoint Sherry Sadison, who is interested as uh, in serving as the elected auditor in Bob Nelson's place for the remainder of his term, which expires on January 2024. Okay, the, the item that I, I glassed over there is the declaration of disaster emergency. Uh, we had made a motion at the workshop meeting to approve the declaration or, of disaster emergency around the winter storm from January 31st through February 2nd. Uh, the motion was carried unanimously. Next is the culvert on Marion Drive at uh, where, near where Jacob Weiss lives. Uh, we have assembled and put in for the dirt and gravel low volume road grant. This was signed uh, very nicely by Peter Wallace. Uh, so at this point, we just have to wait and see if we are able to get the, the grant funding to do that project this year. Um, Jim McCarthy, since we happen to have you on the, the call, yeah. you, you usually have a, an inside track on the prospects of grant funding in that capacity. Is it looking 
good for this year or is it not looking good compared to previous years? They have their, uh, I believe it's, I believe they got just under 300,000 this year to give out for the um, storm sewer projects. Uh, they, they haven't given any out yet. They just started taking them um, last month and they didn't, their board meeting was yesterday. They did not have a, um, a they did not have a dirt and gravel road committee meeting to discuss them yet. So their March meeting will be the first meeting where they're going to discuss any of the applications. So we should be in that first bucket that they'll be talking about. Good. Fantastic. Okay. Next up is the culvert on Sheridan Road at Gerald Hoover's farm near 540 Sheridan Road. Uh, the hole at that location is getting bigger. We had sent a request over to McCarthy Engineering and they had given us a couple of options back around that specifically. After we discussed it a little bit on Saturday, we're thinking roughly to the same tune of the conversation that you and I had, Jim McCarthy, the, uh, the culvert. The precast culvert is probably the best way to do that. The rectangular um, culvert. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So ra rather than the pipes, we're thinking that's the best best path forward to proceed. All um, right. So the next step would be to, to get some more firm pricing around what, what we think the project's going to look like. That way we can try and figure out how to do that with our road crew. Okay. We will, uh, I'll get, we'll get somebody on pricing those up right away. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jim or Irene, or Jim Brooks, I should probably preface that since there's two Jims on the call, but um, Jim Brooks or Irene, do you have any questions around the ask for the culvert at Sheridan Road? No, I, I just want to clarify it with Jim McCarthy then. Um, you think definitely that the box culvert is the way to go as far as longevity and durability? Yeah, the, bo yeah, the box culvert is definitely the, the better long-term solution. And that's actually what, you know, DEP has kind of been pushing all the municipalities to get away from the pipes and go to the box culverts just for the clogging and longevity purpose. Yeah. And obviously they're a lot more expensive. You can't, and you can't always fit one in. And you know, sometimes you just don't have the room for it. But uh, I, I think that's, as long as we can set it or rent a machine to set it, I think that's probably the better way to go. Jim, just a quick question. Are you aware of where your camera's positioned? Mm, probably up in the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. There we go. We like yep. to see. Oh, sorry. I don't worry. I, I, was looked gonna... down and I looked down and I saw the light fixture in the, in the, in the picture. Sorry about that. I don't oh, worry. You're having a bad hair night. Uh, maybe I am, but I wasn't, wasn't on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so when we put the price together, do you want it to just be the materials or do you want us to put it <laughs> Together, if somebody else was installing it, materials I think would be okay. the thing because the, the goal here is to, to do this with our road crew. Okay. And, uh, and if if we we look at this and we find that wow this is going to be a, a bigger thing to tackle than what we have manpower for, then we'll circle back and add in the, the labor pricing. But I think uh, materials would be the best start. Okay. Yeah, it's probably the only thing I'm thinking is we probably would have to run a track hoe to set the box culvert for yeah. the couple of days that we're going to have to probably for two, maybe two days, three days. And the rest of it, I think we could probably do with, with our guys and equipment. Okay. That's good. That's a good use of mm -hmm. what we have at hand. Okay. Next item on the agenda also relates to roads and repairs. The road project for 2021. Uh, I did some, some tinkering and math based on stuff that I knew of and some satellite images off of Google Maps. And uh, I've came to the conclusion that we're going to need 33,840 square feet of skim patch on Sheridan Road, 4,800 square feet on Wintersville Road, 5,536 on Church Road. And uh, we're actually just from based on the, the notes that we had had and just general knowledge of it, Stouchburg Road is going to need to be resurfaced. And uh, I think I sent you an email, Jim, about uh, really asking if that would be worthwhile to do or if it would be prohibitively expensive to do a resurface on basically seven-tenths of a mile. Well, I must have missed that email. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. No, it was, it was a couple of days ago. I'll make sure it's not, like, stuck yeah. in my outbox or anything, but I shot you a quick note saying, like, this is this is kind of what I came to, and 
Huh. Is it, it going to be crazy expensive to do a resurface? Because like we're not, we don't need to do a full depth. Just on the a road. Mill overlay. Just, just a mill and overlay. Yeah, that shouldn't be cost prohibitive. I'm sorry, I must have missed that email. No, it's it's okay if your week's been anything at all like mine. I <laughs> I completely <laughs> it, understand. It has, <laughs> but sorry about that. Uh, no worries. I'll, I'll look at that later tonight and respond. Okay. So the the follow up question is I. It should already be in your already be in your inbox, but if it's not, I'll be glad to send it over again. Um, but we want to make sure that that is included in the the pen bid packet that we had drawn up back in like 2018. Uh, I know we had previously approved you to advertise that, but then we asked to kind of give it pause to make sure that we had like the remedial work. We're not just slapping right. oil and chip over bad. Um, so we would need to add that in kind of taking into a rough ballpark order of magnitude for the price and also list that any crack sealing that would need to be done prior to the the application of the, the oil and chip be done as well. Okay. And then once we have that snapped in, that would be ready to, to go out to Penwood. Did Charlie Paris give us a number on this one yet? They, they, a... they had numbers. I don't know if they expire. Well, they, they were... They were more than they were. I think two projects combined, but I don't know if he gave us one number or two numbers. Should I call him? Just to yeah, cover the we, base, yeah. Yeah, because if we don't have our number, then we won't. They won't pay the. They won't pay the liquid fuels. They won't let us use their liquid fuels if we don't have the project number assigned. And I don't want to get another one if we already have one because yeah. that, that really confuses Charlie. So, so by combining the two-year projects, he should give us one number. Is that what you're saying? Uh, however Charlie did it, we'll make it work. Okay. Here, hold on. So if, if he's got two separate numbers and he wants us to identify it that way, or if he just wants to put it on, it'll be easier under one number, but however he needs us to do it, we'll make it work. Okay. I'll, I'll check with him. Here, by, by the miracles of technology, I am going to share the screen that I have and we'll look and see if the number is listed there for because I had I had called them or emailed them or whatever I did because he had some of the names wrong street names wrong and then he corrected those um, and I don't remember I can't see that yeah, me Oh, there, I'm zooming in. Uh, hold on. I'm trying to zoom in, too. Hold on. No, there's no project number in the top right. Okay, yeah. On the 944. Yeah, so that sounds like maybe he didn't check the okay. other one. Or he just didn't get, he just didn't give it to, didn't give it to us yet. He, he should have one open, because that's yeah. how he stores everything. Yeah, there's no project number on either of those. Okay. No, there's not. So I will give Peter, you a call. Peter, is there any chance we can do any additional road work this year? Oh, yeah. There's budget for it. But the uh, the goal here was to get this one out quick because there's a, right. it's a it's a pretty big packet to begin with. But we, we did plenty of budgeting for, for other road work, too. The next, yeah, so we, we have we've this talked out. about canal. We've talked about canal road. It's awful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Based on some conversation that we're going to have to have around Act 537 towards the end of the meeting, let's let's save that. And the only reason that I say that is if we find ourselves in a situation where we are putting in something that requires digging up the road in the next couple of years, let's, let's delay doing some of those roads that would be impacted by that. That way we're not putting a nice new coating down only to, to dig it up again. Because it's, it's always unfortunate when like UGI or anybody else does that. I, I, hate to do it to ourselves but uh okay. to that end we we did go heavy on budgeting for the road work because of the the need for so so much road work throughout the township okay so circling back to the uh, bid packet um sue will you call charlie tomorrow and ask I, him i will and i just okay. keep in mind that he doesn't get back to me real quickly uh, that's that's fine. Um, we gotta start the I'll, dialogue. I'll call now. in every day if I have to. Okay, F fantastic. And I and I found your email, Peter. I'm sorry. I oh no, no, it's, it's okay. Everything that we just went over should be in there because I took basically yeah. the the same bullet points that I put in the in the agenda, or I had, had Sue put in the agenda was what was in your email. 
Okay. So that's uh, I think that's what we're going to need for that, and we can get that out, and we'll we'll do to your point, Jim Brooks. We'll do the the road work in, in two larger chunks, or one big chunk and a couple of smaller chunks throughout the rest of the year. Um, later on in the agenda, we also have line painting that we need to talk about too. Um, but again, we don't want to we don't want to paint a road and then immediately pave over it. So we got to carefully keep things in order so that we're not not doing silly things like that. Um, also related to roads, the next item on the agenda is the COSTARS, uh, COSTARS Road Salt Contract Renewal. Uh, we discussed this at the workshop meeting and made a motion to renew the contract for 200 tons for the 2021-2022 season. By the nature of how that contract works, we would need to take a minimum of 60% uh, or up to a maximum of 140%. Um, as we start to exit the winter season, we have a, a pretty good supply of salt present. So we're not fully loaded, but we have a, a pretty good supply even before the, the start of the next cold season. Next item on the agenda after that is street sweeping. Uh, we made a motion at the workshop to schedule the street sweeping for May 12th with a rain date of May 13th. Uh, the secretary is waiting for a call back from industrial grounds to make sure that they're able to, to meet those dates on their schedule. Stones are going to be dumped at the township building per the usual. In the past, the fire company has provided water, so we'll need to make that ask to them again. Approximately 60 no parking signs will need to be posted uh, roughly a week in advance of those dates, which once we get confirmation, uh, we can schedule to go out and put them up like we usually do. Uh, take a, a little bit of time and a, a staple gun and get the signs up. Next item on the agenda is the Berks County Cooperative Purchasing Council line painting. Uh, Sue has been working on getting pricing. Last year we submitted for 10 miles and it was uh, it was actually not, not done last year. Uh, so we have those 10 miles that we had specced out uh, in addition to anything else that we want to identify as requiring line painting. Um, I mentioned at the Saturday workshop meeting that we should all, all take note, supervisors, secretary, anybody in the community that happens to know somewhere that the, the lines are faded or particularly worn. I tend to notice it around turns the most. There's a number of hills and turns and things like that where they they tend to wear out the fastest. If you see anything, let me know, send me an email, give me a call, and we'll, we'll snap that into the, the consideration for getting lines repainted and make sure that it fits into everything else that we're gonna be trying to do in terms of road work. Next item on the agenda is the front end loader. The tires on the front end loader were in dire need of replacement. And unfortunately we, we hit that point of that need during one of the snowstorms. So uh, we authorized uh, the purchase of two tires from Kepley's Tires. They quoted a price of $320 per tire, mounting included. Uh, but we had also gotten quotes from several other places, uh, Binkley and Hearst, which quoted a price of $335 per tire, including mount, or not including mounting, which was extra. They did not specify a price. Zimmerman Farm Service, which quoted $345 per tire and an additional $90 per hour, uh, specking out roughly two hours of time to mount. So with Kepley's being the cheapest and being fairly close by, we authorized the, the purchase and installation of this tire so that we could continue to address the snowfall. Next up on the agenda is the Conrad Weiser Youth Baseball. Uh, this is roughly the time of year where we usually get a request to have their, their practice and their season on the ball field. However, with the playground being closed because of COVID, we have opted to inform them that uh, this season is likely going to be not available for that. It's in everyone's best interest and the best interest of public safety to not have the, the games there until such time as we reopen the playground. Next item on the agenda is the Aikens Accounting Audit. Uh, that has been started and it is going well. I'll turn it over to Irene and Dan if there's anything additional that they'd like to add on that particular point. Just waiting for uh, one more piece of paper from the tax collector to come in and that was the only other bit of information that they requested and uh, 
Um, hopefully they'll get sent over the next day or so. And uh, I'm hoping to conclude it. So far, we've only gotten positive feedback from the uh, group and uh, a reminder that we're able to contact them with any questions that we have throughout the year. So if it's a code of accounts uh, issue, anything pertaining to any of the accounting issues that we have, they'll certainly be willing to help us out. Okay, that's very good. I think we have a, a good good thing going with Akins. Not that we had any problems with RKL, but there, it seems to be a, a, a very friendly and uh, immediate sort of uh, Sort yeah. of feedback mechanism with Akins. Yeah, and they uh, they also said that they would help us to um, improve our accounting um, habits and to make it an easier process in the future. Good, very good. And uh, goes without saying, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Thank you very much for your hard work on that, Irene and Dan and Sue. The yeah. the hard work that everybody's put in on on that has really shown through on the fact that this has been an extremely, extremely easy and, and smooth audit so far. Next item on the agenda is also audit related is the liquid fuel audit. Uh, we got the one back for 2019. There were no issues there. The report was received and we had nothing that was uh, for attention even. So job well done there on getting, getting that prepped because I know that was uh, that, that was a little bit of a weird timetable on that and there was some some back and forth questions originally around the liquid fuel things for like one of the deposits but um that was that was pretty cut and dry once that was ironed out yeah Sue, i need to get that stuff over is it to earl helbing for 2020 stuff i think that's the note that's on the desk i need to get that over again yeah i think he actually um he puts in the he puts in the numbers and that kind of starts the accounting uh, or the audit process. Yeah. yeah. It's a certain know. form that needs to fill out that he fills out for yeah. us. Yeah. I'll, I'll give him a call. I got to take a look at my calendar when I could be down at the office because now we realize we could scan off of my computer too. So mm -hmm. I don't have to bombard you for any of that. So. Okay. While we're on the, the subject of audits, not, a, not an agenda item, but just out of curiosity, have we done the PERTA yet? Oh, no, because we just got in the form, and that should be something I'll hoping to get that done next week. Okay, good, because that's I know that one is a that was a little bit of a bear last year. Um, yeah, because uh, we just were confused with the numbers. So yeah, um, you and I took some notes last year. I'm just looking at my calendar. Wednesday, Dan, if you have time, I'll probably make Wednesday the date to go down to the office. Um, and we'll do the perda because I um, I don't think much has changed since last year. So yeah, no. We took notes last year, so we left ourselves breadcrumbs for this year, so. Okay, good, very good. Okay, next item on the agenda is the website. Um, we've been providing content to CMS over the past number of weeks and months. The last element prior to going live is staff training, which we have scheduled for not tomorrow, but the following Friday at 4 p.m. Uh, they have agreed to do it through Zoom so that we can record it. That way we have a a reference point to look back to if we ever have any any questions or things that we were, we're confused about and then we can go through the the final process of getting it deployed to production um, i'll be contacting the the individual that you had forwarded me the the information for sue about getting any of the the main like a records and stuff like that switched over so anybody going to the old site automatically is redirected to the new one so i'll work with civic and with the the county webmasters on that and make sure that everything gets squared away when we, we actually go to flip the light switch on. Next up is the noise ordinance proposal. Uh, Andy was kind enough to email several ordinance from other municipalities for reference. Uh, Irene, do you want to? Andy, I have a question for you. Thank you very much for uh, sending that over. And uh, this is something we had discussed at the workshop. Um, uh, <laughs> And especially the article that you sent over about um, um, using an app to read the the decibels, um, yes. I, I I thought that was that was really interesting. And actually, the article is old now because it only referenced I think up to iPhone five. Um, right. Yeah, whatever. We're at twelve now. So in comparison, the the one that I proposed had that specific decibel amount. As I was looking at the the ones that you sent over. It's just the definition of noise disturbance is is very vague. Um, again, like, is that something, do we want to be so specific? Because 
science tells us like an average conversation is 60 decibels. If I'm sitting in my house and I hear the neighbor doing something outside, that noise has to be 70 decibels or more. So is it of any benefit to us as a township to have a decibel amount in the ordinance or is it harmful to us? Will a court um, like or dislike an app that recorded the, um, the noise or is it sufficient to say, I was sitting in my house and I heard this noise and assuming that the noise is repetitive, disturbing, all this other stuff, because all the ordinances that you sent over, the noise disturbance description was all very brief. So it, uh, for those of you that don't, aren't familiar with it, the first part usually says endangers or in injures the safety or health or humans of animals. That's a subjective assessment. A noise or disturbs a reasonable person of normal sensitivities. Endangers or injures a person or real property is audible on a public street for a distance of 50 feet from the place or origin of sound, of such sound or noise. Whereas our, the one that I propose has that 60 decibel threshold. So, um, in your opinion, is, is specific a little bit better? Or is, because like, as I was looking at the definition of noise, noise disturbance, I'm saying to myself, it's kind of vague. And I know in general, pushing an issue with a noise disturbance is, is one of those things like someone's going to call the cops. The cops are going to say, hey, you know, what was going on? You're going to say, hey, I'm sitting in my living room and I can hear the music. So I don't know. You know, what's your opinion? Is, is it going to hurt us to have a specific decibel amount? or No, you... no, I don't think okay. so. I think okay. it's probably a good idea to have a set level because that's your measuring point. You're right. Some ordinances are subjective and it's going to be, you know, you have to have that person come and testify and it comes down to a believability right. factor. If there's no, it's very difficult to prove um, right. that, that there was a noise disturbance based on somebody's word right. against somebody else's uh, where you do have problems. I guess it's from, from that article is with apps that haven't been vetted enough you know to to be clear to the court that th these are accurate there are decibel level readers and i learned like in the last month that i believe craft codes has has used those okay so now you know that doesn't help you at like 10 p.m on a friday night right right because so craft doesn't gonna be there wait so so Thinking, think, try and think more like a lawyer. It, it, you know, in my instance, I'm, I'm saying to myself, okay, so now I've got, you know, someone calls in, there's a complaint, I hear noise, I'm sitting in my living room. That's about as specific that they can be with it. But science can tell us that noise level outside their home has to be at least 70 decibels in order for them to, to hear it in their house, you know, to have it being audible, you know, because we've, we've measured those things. We know we can, we could say on average what those noises are. You know, we, we all know what a lawnmower sounds like from those of us sitting in our house. We know we could hear it outside of our home and we know we we've measured and can say what the average lawnmower noise is like. So, so uh, you know, I guess, you know, in your opinion, do you think that's something we should include in that particular aspect of our ordinance? Yeah, I think having a decibel level in there is, is, is a smart thing to do. Okay. And then yeah. uh, Peter was concerned about the issue with um, the, the, the chickens and agriculture. And so I, I apologize, Irene. I actually, I in the course of reading through everything again multiple times, I did actually notice that you, ha you do actually have letter I, which yeah. I missed the first time around, which I think covers that specifically. Um, where it says uh, noise generated from agricultural production activities, including agricultural animals, uh, equipment and field machinery used and maintained in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications. So that's an exception. Yep. That's one of the exemptions. So I, I think oh, yeah. with that, that there, that kind of puts to rest any of the concerns that I had, because we have, we do have people, myself included, that have like chickens, or we have people that have like goats in some areas or horses and cows and things like that, that we, for, for better or worse, we live in an agricultural community and there are a couple of things that, we, that just kind of go along with that part and parcel. Right. But there's a difference between the chickens and then and there's, you know, if you have a 
a screeching bird, you know, someone's pet that constantly screeches continuously, let's say they leave the house and, you know, and you hear it in your home, that that's a completely different story. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or if you have dogs that are just outside constantly barking at all hours yeah. of the day. I, and I get that. I completely agree with you on that in terms of one versus the other. I just was concerned that if we had, if we didn't have it segmented, it would be a situation where like, well, we've been, we've inadvertently made just about everybody in the area not be compliant with this ordinance at one right, one right, meter or another. Right now, I'm all I'm all for the ladies in the morning clucking. So, um, no, and uh, Andy, I honestly, I really liked um, you included the in one of them a prima facie violation. It disturbs two or more residents who are in general agreement that reside in different re residences. That was in the. Um, for Laurel Dale's um, ordinance, that was pretty good. I guess the other thing is, um, do we want to extend uh, powers to craft code to go out to enforce it? So do we want to strictly keep this as part of police? I would like craft code to be able to say, hey, you know. We I don't have any objection. Yeah. I don't have any objection to that. And so there's, there's a whole bunch of nice little clauses Andy, that you have uh, throughout a couple of them, um, if you, if it's okay, uh, if I could work with you or whatever, um, to revamp some of what I uh, wrote, just to include some of the other little things I think would make it would bulk it up a little bit better. So yeah, that's what I gave them to you. Yep. Yeah, be yeah. Great. So yeah. I'll 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 redo mine a little bit and I'll yeah. throw it back over to you. Um, and I'm hoping this is just one of those things that we have it on the books and once the website's up and running, it's available for people to read. And it's just one of those things like you say to, hey, people, hey, listen, you know, be a kind, considerate neighbor. What you're doing is, is disruptive and we'd like you to stop. You know, I hate to, I hate to throw out the big guns and, and, and get anyone in trouble legally, but I think it's certain, something that's certainly warranted and some people are going to be nice neighbors and some people aren't. So It's it's kind of like the IPMC and this is what we talked about at yeah. the workshop, that it's it's a tool that's useful yeah. to help yeah. people. We don't have to use it to beat people up and that's not the intent. It's to solve a problem, not create them. Yeah, but thank you so much, Andy. I really appreciate it. Sure, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. Richland, Richland just, oh, I'm sorry, Jim, go ahead. I was going to say, Irene, uh, most of these complaints are going to come in the evening. How are you going to have Craft Code come out in the evening to well, check craft, things out? Craft right. can also do it. The yeah. police, police can do it too, but to right. Irene's point, we open up an avenue during the day where Craft could do it rather than police. Okay. As long as it's yeah, spelling out at either, either one. Either one can enforce. That's the way we should set it up. But yeah. Yeah. decibel level readers um, are not as expensive as I thought. They're I think Richland got one for like less than a hundred dollars. Um, yeah, like sixty bucks. Yeah, so um, they're. I mean, they're all different prices. You can, you can go up to, you know, getting a hyper hypersensitive one. I guess that does has all the bells and whistles, but I don't think you need that. I think a good one is is a hundred dollars, from what I'm told. Yeah, as long as you can switch them between intensities A, B, and C, then they're admissible in court or valid for PennDOT studies. Yeah. So almost all of them are, except like the $20 ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, might be worth saying something to the, the Tulpa Hawken police about that. Although, really late they in the evening, we don't... One. They might have one already. And the other thing that we have to consider is there there are hours of the day where we don't have Tulpa Hawken, where it's state police. And that's, care. Uh, uh, I was going to say, and they're not, they're not going to do that. No. So, so I think it's the back to back to the original point. I think it's a beneficial thing. I agree with you that it's, it's a good thing that we should do. And uh, I look forward to reading the, the revised draft that you send out with some of the, the some yeah. of the, the additional clauses added. Yeah. Thank you again, Nancy. I really appreciate it. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, next up on the agenda is uh, Marion Fire Company made a request for a waiver on building permit fees. Um, we're not inherently opposed really to granting a, a por the waiver for our portion. However, not all those fees come to Marion Township. There is a, a portion of those fees that are properly and rightfully collected by Craft Code. Uh, so we've 
ask that they reach out to craft code asking for a waiver and if craft is interested in in pursuing that then we can we can move forward on it um, and, unless we have anything additional we kind of left off on wait wait and see how everything develops and and go from there okay irene and jim if you don't have anything to add we'll move on to the next point Landmark Homes is asking for a waiver request uh, for building permit fees on a 299 Sweet Birch Lane. The house was never built. Um, we have asked Kraft to give a, a list of costs that would have been, been incurred by them. Uh, the rationale being that we would refund the unused components of the fees. The actual application fee itself is non-refundable per the, the form it and the, the wording therein, uh, but if there was anything beyond that that they have paid, if it hasn't been used, it's my opinion that they're entitled to a refund of those unused funds. And I took a look at the uh, permit itself. It does not say anything about fees being non-refundable, so yeah. I'm for refunding it if the house was never built for whatever reason. I am. Yeah. I, I am okay. too. Yeah. Good. So we're all in agreement on that. So we'll wait yeah. and, and see what the actual use of what they've paid in is and then if there's a, a surplus we'll we'll refund them of whatever that amount is mm -hmm. okay and just for good measure just to make it official i'll make a motion that uh any unused funds for the the building permit fees of 299 sweet birch lane be refunded to landmark homes uh, upon receiving a total of costs uh, assessed so far by craft code or any other source Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay. Next up on the agenda is the Bethel Marion Tulpen, uh, Tulpahocken Open Space Plan. The, we have received a letter indicating that the final payment was made and that all documentation has been received. Um, one of the items that's out on the public Google Drive directory is actually that that plan. Anybody that would like to see it, it is out there for, for public review. Um, if you don't happen to choose to use the Google Drive, you're certainly welcome to put in a right to know request and we can give you a digital copy of that. It's a pretty lengthy thing, so you, you may not want to print it out. But uh, one way or the other, if you'd like to see it, we'll make sure that you have a, a chance to look at it. The big benefit to having this is we are able to use it for a number of grant applications, most notably some of the ones that involve things like the, the playground. So when the community association actually goes to make a, a grant application or be awarded any grant funding, this is gonna be very, very helpful and be reflected very beneficially in the review of that grant application. Next up on the agenda is the appointment of road crew. Um, we made a motion at the workshop meeting to appoint the following individuals to the road crew, Travis Oberholzer, Dave Patrick, and Josh Bellman. I also got a call from Tony Brubaker throughout the week with two other individuals who would be uh, very good additions to the road crew. One of them uh, is uh, an individual who has a CDL and is retired and would be available pretty much all the time. Um, and another one who would be available most of the time, especially when it snows because he would not be able to go into work. So I have to give them calls and I unfortunately do not have their names in front of me because the post-it note that I wrote them down on, my daughter ran away with. So I have to find out where she left it <laughs> or I have to call Tony again. But either way, there are two more people that we should potentially be able to get onto the road crew. So uh, with that said, I think we're, we're, we're in a, a better space going into next year than we were this year. The road crew did an a excellent job in all in, intents and purposes. Um, I'll, I'll go more into that when I go into comments, but uh, there were a couple of problem areas for roads and things like that. But with everything else that was coming into play on that, they did a masterful job of keeping the roads open. And in the, the worst of the storm, we actually got a compliment around how well the roads were kept open in, in critical areas throughout Marion Township. Next item on the agenda is the riding mower repairs. 
uh, we made a motion at the workshop meeting to make the necessary repairs to the riding mower in advance of the spring season. It needs a, a couple of seals replaced and some just general maintenance uh, so that it's ready for grass cutting. Next item on the agenda is the Berks County Household Hazardous Waste Collection. Uh, this is going to be held at the Governor Mifflin Intermediate School on Saturday, April 17th, 2021 from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Pre-registration is required and can be done online through the county website. So if you have any hazardous waste, old paint, things of that nature that you need to get rid of, this is the, the best time to do it. And uh, side note to that, we can't, unfortunately, because we're a municipality, we can't take all the, the junk that's in the uh, garage to there, but uh, we should, once the weather turns, we should call Elk and see about having them get it. Because we got everything kind of sorted into one, one principal area. We just need somebody to come and dispose of it now. Next item on the agenda is the Pennsylvania Compensation Rating Bureau. The PCRB is conducting a study of Code 994, the Volunteer Fire Company. They want a brief questionnaire completed on their website. Uh, I will be reaching out to the fire company, most likely to Daryl, uh, to coordinate a meeting. Um, I know Irene and Jim and uh, John uh, have expressed an interest in being present as well. I think that's going to be a, a good thing and a good bridge building opportunity where we can hopefully get through that form and maybe broach some of the other topics around uh, improved safety gear, other grant opportunities, and some of the, the financial disclosures from the fire company that we have not gotten in years prior. So I'll keep you guys informed as to when we can do that. Um, it may be a situation where, depending on everybody's work schedule, we may have to try to do it on a weekend, but I'll make sure that we're sensitive to, to everybody's schedule, us and the fire company, when, when we go to set that up. Okay, the second to last, I'm actually going to go slightly out of order, Sue, before you tell me I skipped something again. Um, the PennDOT mowing contract, uh, we have a three-year contract that expired December 31st, 2020, and let me actually find where that is in the packet. There it is. We actually just got that in... We actually got it yesterday. So, yeah. So I've not gotten a full chance to read through it, but the, the basic gist of it is they would, it was a sum not to exceed $4,809.64 to do the, the mowing, the roadway mowing that we normally do. That's, that's for the three years. Yes. So they're basing it on $98.72 per mile per mowing cycle. And then they, they multiply that by the lane miles, which are 8.12 8 miles, and the number of mowing cycles, which are six. So that's how they, they do the math to get it to $4,800. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to read it over before we take action on it, but it's it seems pretty pretty standard. This looks almost identical to what we got last year and the year before that. Well, I, di I didn't have a chance to pull the one from three years ago to see what the numbers were. Um, so any any of the times that this has come up, I would have only been, actually, I would have been, first year I was on the board would have had one, but we've talked well, about it, it been, prior. it would have been 17. It would have been, okay, maybe it was the, before or I started. It would have I've, started in 18. It would have ended in 17 and started yeah. in 18. So that's 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 where I saw that, and we have yeah. we've I know we've talked about this out of cycle. We've talked about this in the and the the snow removal a couple of times. The snow removal one we had a renewal on too, but mm -hmm. I want to read it before we agree to it for sure. But it looks pretty standard. Mm -hmm. So I read, and they, and they require us to mow twice in the summer. Yeah. So Irene, Jim, in advance of the the next meeting give this a good thorough look over it's not it's not overly long it's a couple more than a couple of pages but it's it's not war and peace either so and i could look um, at the numbers in the computer see what yeah yeah and it's like andy said it's it's a pretty standard calculation mm -hmm. it's like mileage mm -hmm. at the federal rate it's not there's not a lot of room for interpretation or or number fudging there 
and there's no room for negotiation. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so chances are we're, we're going to agree to it, but just on general principle, I'd like to look it over before we sign anything. Okay, and the last item on the agenda that I, like I said, went slightly out of order on is the Act 537. So we had sent a memo to DEP outlining some of our concerns and some of the, the areas that we want to improve upon and change within the plan. Uh, I know, Jim McCarthy, you had been in contact with Tim Wagner around some of the, the things. Um, and uh, we actually, earlier this afternoon, I, I forwarded it to you guys, everybody as a group, but we got a, a rather succinct letter uh, more or less just saying no. So we need to we need to assess how we're going to approach handling this because I, I still have very serious concerns the way our plan is written that we've basically locked ourselves into a, a $5 million public works project irrespective of what we actually get in, in funding. And to put it lightly, that, that scares me. Um, one of the, the things that uh, I know we had brought up in the past, and Andy, you had brought it to our attention, is the capacity, the overall capacity at Womelsdorf has diminished in the past couple of years because of people buying up more and more of the EDUs. So the way our plan really it, it lays everything on the fact that we are going to connect to Womelsdorf. So if we run into a situation where Womelsdorf does not have the capacity or we think that is going to be a very real possibility or consideration, what does that mean for our Act 537 plan? Is Do we have legs to stand on to potentially challenge or, or ask for revision based on that point? <clears throat> yeah, in my opinion, yes, that, that would be a difference maker because, um, because circumstances have changed and they've changed to the point where you can't feasibly um, fulfill your plan. Now, we're, one of the options, uh, if I remember correctly, there was to build build our own um, plant. It's it's touched on briefly, and that's that's actually one of the things that I wanted to expand upon in the plan. Mm -hmm. the, the The main bulk of the revision is I wanted to set that that kind of decision making gate up front of Do we have the need and the funding to be able to do this? If the answer is yes, then we go down the avenue. Okay, is it better to connect to Womelsdorf or is it connect, better to build our own plant? If we don't have the need and the funding, the grant funding available for it, um, we do best technical guidance and we circle back to that the following year and we have that same conversation. Do we need it? Can we afford it? Yes or no. So I know it goes into some some detail about setting up our own plant, but it, it doesn't go to the, the level of specificity that the, the Womelsdorf connection one does. And I think if we're, if we're actually going to have to seriously entertain that that concept, Womelsdorf doesn't have the capacity, but we, we do have the funding, then we we would need to flesh that out a little bit more. But back to the original point, we, we might be putting cart before horse because uh, we, we might have to, to figure out how best to approach this if, if we do have a situation where they say, no, you're, you're doing this. And we, we say, like, no, we can't afford it. There's no possible way that this can be done yeah. financially speaking i think i think as it stands now i think and there's been no official request made um to wimblestorf regarding their capacity but i think that there is right now still capacity however it's extremely tight mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's maybe that's jim mccarthy the logical next step would be to make a formal inquiry to them to to see where the yeah, my and Jim, I see you drinking a, water, a glass of water, so I'm going to use this opportunity to throw one thing in. My my thought on this is we try to arm ourselves with a couple of things and then go back to DEP and say, like, yes, we understand that you you said in that letter that uh, uh, you don't really agree with what we put in the letter, but here's details about the capacity and our concerns that by the time we actually go to implement this, because it's not an overnight thing, it's going to be at least a couple of years to to get the, the show on the road for that, um, that Wolmelsdorf isn't going to have the volume that we, we're going to need and get a, an income study done to say, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. A lot of the things that the, the plan makes solid 
decisions based on aren't factual anymore or have changed so drastically that it's it's no longer valid. I mean, quite frankly, the response is, unless you know where we can find $5 million, you're being unreasonable. I, I agree. Right, but but the plan has an alternative plan that we build our own plant. Even though it wasn't fleshed out, it's still in there. So, so Irene, to that point, the price is roughly about the same. It's very, very similar. Right. So we're we're kind of, we're talking apples right. to apples here. Right, but, that's yeah, the, uh, the DE, that, right, but that was what was submitted. So mm -hmm. the DEP is gonna say, it's not our problem that you didn't flesh this out. It, it's it's your issue and you need to make it happen. That's my concern with the plan. Yeah. The DEP yeah. doesn't care that we don't have the money. The DEP doesn't care that Wilmersdorf doesn't have the capacity. The DEP only cares that there's a plan, it's submitted, and you need to start working on your funding and get, get, get it moving. So having never worked with anyone, but, you know, I mean, that's, that's the hard line I, I'm afraid that they're going to take, so... Yeah, and the, the prior board submitting this for approval really has put us in a rough spot yeah. because yeah. The, once it once it's in and approved, that it is a game changer. It is a very different dynamic than when your plan is still waiting to be submitted. We need to start following the timetable and start taking action. We can't let it just go because then we're going to face fines, you know, and that's a whole mm -hmm. other disaster, so... Yeah, and as as we talked about before, I feel it, it <clears throat> cause for reiteration. Doing a hard poll on the plan, like some have suggested, no. would would be it would have a lot of very negative consequences around things. That I, that would go down a, a path that I don't think we want to go down. Yeah, we can't afford to. We can't. We it's like being caught between a rock and a hard place. It, it, it we're we're bound by the lack of decision that. 30, 40 years ago, people didn't make when the funds were available, and now we've been giving a poor decision, and we need to make the best of it what we can. So, uh, Jim McCarthy, were you about to say something before? I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, the reader Andy's comment, I have talked with Wilmersdorf, and they have, currently they have capacity for us. And the dollar figures of the initial upfront costs were pretty much a wash of building our own plant versus the Wilmersdorf plant. The reason why it wasn't explored in detail was DEP and EPA don't tend to like wastewater treatment plants right next to one another. Yep. So once it was determined that the costs were close to one another, it was left in there, but it was decided to not talk about it in detail because the odds of it being permittable were very unlikely with okay. the plant down the, downstream from that. Um, I think, you know, I think part of the, you know, I'm just, I, I, I've been thinking about the letter, I've been thinking about the response, it kind of wasn't the response that I was really expecting to get either today, and I've kind of just been thinking about it since I read the letter earlier, from, I'm trying to put myself in Tim's shoes, and, and I'm guessing, and, and I came up with, and I could be off base of why the letter was written like that. From his from his seat, we've done nothing other than pass an on lot sewer management ordinance since the plan's been approved. We haven't gone out and inspected system one. We haven't we haven't done anything. <clears throat> I think once we've done something, we may be dealing with a more receptive audience on their end. Okay. Um, no, we did we did we did pass the we did pass the ordinance. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what he said. Like we haven't. That's that's been the extent of it. But in fairness to us, that's there's the, other than really cracking down on people, and uh, some of this uh, I'll I'll admit is has been us, me, etc. We need to get people aware. We need to badger people about this is something that you have to do now. We're going to be meeting with Alan Madera, who's the new SEO, about crafting some very specific wording. We have the letter just about ready to go, but we want to have him give it a look over to make sure that it meets his scrutiny as the new SEO before we send that out. But that details some things around getting your systems pumped out, getting it inspected, 
uh, stuff around joint zoning, some just kind of general updates about the Act 537 that we, we might now have to retool slightly in that letter. Um, yeah, but, and I, uh, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't critiquing. Oh, okay. yeah. No, I no, no, just, no, no, no. I, I, I understand. I was, I was surprised to get that letter kind of from Tim with no heads up, actually. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. I, thought I, I thought I would have at least gotten like a phone call. Like, hey, I got this. I see what you're saying here can go along with this, but not that. And to just get that letter emailed out today, I was like, I, I, it kind of took me back because I was like, that seemed really odd to get that kind of response. Yeah, and being as this is a, a recorded public forum, I'm going to choose my words very carefully, but I don't understand on a personal note a lot of the holdup simply because we're not we're not looking to welch out on it we're not and i know a lot of people have said like no sewer no sewer no sewer the cold hard reality is if you have two shreds of common sense and there is actually going to be a benefit be it ecological or financial to the community that yes it's actually if you look at it over a 20 year span it's cheaper than having people have to replace all of these systems that are potentially 50 60 70 years old Right. We, if we know that that's the case and we can make the informed decision, then we do that. And that's, that's just the cold, hard reality of it. What we're looking for is largely one little bit of assurance from the DEP that you're not going to get railroaded into doing this if you can't afford it. I don't think the DEP cares. I think you're right. But uh, I would think, <laughs> I would think, because uh, like we, we having met with DEP once right. before, they were very, very quick to say like, no, don't worry. This, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. If you're, if you're in need of it, you'll get the money. But my concern is, and, and we've all seen this with various things, grant money isn't a guaranteed every year. And then you have to fight amongst other people to get it. So you, the timing may be very poor or maybe not money available that year and you may find yourselves in dire straits for a wildly expensive project so we need to get on their timetable and start taking action and not so I, th anymore. I think dan is either frozen or trying to raise his hand so i just, dan. i don't understand i don't understand what, what seems to be a, a, a 180 degree pivot yeah, from, from the last time that we, we talked to them, they seemed to be receptive and, and, you know, listening to what we had to say. Maybe they were receptive, but they just didn't like what we had to say. But I don't know if it would be worth a call uh, from, from Jim to, to Tim. I mean, I'll, at this point, I'll take any inroad or avenue that we can try to get get us to where we need to be so jim if you if you have the opportunity and you think it would be beneficial to call tim wagner and try to get a read on that like we're not we're not trying to welch out of doing what's needed or the right thing we want to make sure that we do the right thing in the right order and in a responsible way for the taxpayers peter yes stan Am I under the understanding that Schaefer's town basically went through the same thing that we're going through yeah. So, yeah, for the most part, yeah. What happened to them? Got the, strong. DEP came in and bid it and built it and sent the bill to Schaefer's Town. Yeah, they got. What they, happened? I don't think Schaefer's Town even su submitted a plan in the first place. Yeah, that's. Then they, got, then they got hit with a consent order, and then yeah, they, it was a forced bill. Yeah, it, it's similar enough in the sense that they got they got railroaded by it. But there have been other, and I think, was it Robison that they submitted a plan like ages ago that called for sewer? And because it was not cost uh, feasible, they just didn't do it. They didn't do it, didn't do it, didn't do it. And eventually the DEP said, look, you put in this plan in a very almost identical fashion to, to what we have. You put in this plan saying you're going to do it. Now you need to do it. And they, I think they, they got to the point of threatening lawsuit and stuff like that and the DEP said like look you either take the funding or you don't get anything mm -hmm. and then they ultimately had to do it because you can't it's it's difficult to afford with funding it's impossible to infor, afford without funding so I guess so uh, Jim then I guess if you can give Tim a call just to see if there's anything else that was behind that that email 
but I guess the next step is is making if we can make the formal inquiry to Wommelsdorf to see what their availability is and I guess we need to start paying attention to the timetable and start taking action. Yeah, the next thing on the timetable is that income study. Okay. That's what we need to do. And thankfully, as we talked about before, that's that's kind of multi-purpose. That's something that can be used for either the actual project or as data to say like look like there's there's no possible way short of getting 70 percent or better funding that this is even going to be remotely affordable um that it's an, it's another a aspect of of data that we we don't really have a good historical figure for other than census data would tim be able to give us a, a guesstimate on grants that are available and how much we could possibly be looking at because we can't afford this period <laughs> Well, it, it, a lot of it has to do with your census data <clears throat> when that's done. We're right now we're compiling the list of all the eligible grants that are out there for 21 and 22 relative to sewer systems. So we should have that for you before next meeting. Um, right. As far as the dollar amount, I mean, these, these things usually end up being funded by PennBest or RUS. Rural Utility Service or PennBest. Um, personally, I don't like Rural Utility Service because it's it's a longer term with a little higher interest rate. But you know, you know, it's a forty year term, so you start your your capital items are really need to be replaced by when you're still paying the note. Um, PennBest usually ends up being a grant and a loan component at one percent interest rate, which in most cases ends up being the best deal. Fleetwood just got a three and a half million dollar PennBest loan. I think the interest rate was like a little less than one, maybe for like the first year, and they paid interest only for a year, and then and after that, it was like one one point two percent for the life right. of it. And Peter, don't forget, I mean, some people in our community may have been impacted by COVID. So incomes may have gone down and that might benefit us to a certain extent. So. Yeah, yeah, that might be the, the best of a bad situation, speaking purely factually there. But yeah. even even so, it, it yes, there's loans available. Even 1% is as good as you're going to get on a loan. But mm -hmm. the, the thing about that is that's still $5, uh, $5 million potentially if we're not accounting for any grants in this particular mental exercise split across 165 edus that is a that is a very very big big fraction ridiculous <laughs> yeah so i'm sure let's let's try and and i'll say mend any fence that we can jim mccarthy i i and if, i think everybody here would appreciate if, if you can call tim and see get a feel for that See if there's anything that can go there. Otherwise, we'll have to, to regroup, reassess, see what our, our strategy is. But um, since we are technically on the clock, we're going to have to try to march forward on that and start some of those items. I think we'd be in a better bet going back to them after we have our funding list determined. And Alan has already done zone one of the one lot management system. I think you're going to, I think we're going to find them in a more cooperative state of mind. Okay. That's, uh, that's fair. So Irene, I have, no, I have no idea what, I have no problem calling Tim. Yeah. Um, I just have to think about what the heck I'm going to talk to him about. <laughs> um, okay. So much of an opening in his, in his response. Yeah. It was, it was Kurt. It was very, yeah. very Kurt. It sounded um, angry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe Jim, you ask him, hey, you know, if these, would these couple of things put you in a better mood? <laughs> yeah. If these things are done. But otherwise, <laughs> Irene, Jim Brooks, I'll try to set up some time with Alan this upcoming week so we can get that letter out there and start trying to expediently move through zone one and possibly okay. into zone two throughout 2021. I think the biggest thing is like we can we can enact ordinances and technically speaking you're supposed to be aware of it but to be fair to everybody if you don't know you don't know and there's not not a lot of great communication avenues and even like once the website's up we can post it out there but 
we have a good number of people in the community that simply don't use computers. So we're going to have to get something out in, in, in various avenues and media to make sure that people are aware of this and actively doing it. Yep. So, okay. Um, Jim Brooks or Irene, do you have anything that you would like to add? Uh, just to update, uh, what, are we going to supervisor's comments now? Uh, yeah, and so if you don't have anything on Act 537, I'll, I'll make a couple of quick comments. Um, yeah. Sue, I actually didn't see the police report in the packets. Like it's not... uh, you know what? I think I forgot to scan it. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. I just wanted to make sure I'd, I didn't miss it. So it's not a good oh. day. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's been it's um, been you, a week like that. Do you want me to read it? Oh yeah, if you have it, that'd be fantastic. Um, five total incidents, one complaint, five miscellaneous calls for service, four telephone silence. Six EMS fire advisories, five traffic stops, three citations, one traffic accident, 54 security checks. Okay, very good. Yep. Sounds like pretty stereotypical month then. A yep, little, little bit of here and there, nothing major. Okay, uh, just to reiterate uh, the comment about the road crew and the snow removal, we received a uh, note from the Berks County Public Works Association complimenting our road crew on their excellent job at snow removal during the, the worst of the snowfall. Um, during this time, it is worth highlighting that they did all of this while the big truck was in the shop because the water pump had failed. And uh, we had a, a control problem with the little truck at one point with a hydraulic hose. Um, and then we also had a hydraulic hose problem on the front end, uh, front end loader. Uh, after that, once we had those things fixed, the uh, the PTO on the tractor gave out. So it was one thing kind of right after another, and they they kept up with it. They kept things moving and, and were uh, a pretty well-oiled machine throughout that whole process. So special thanks to all the guys on the road crew. I do want to set up a, a meeting, kind of a recap, see if there's anything there's a, a lesson learned that we can take into next year from this past year, um, whether it's maybe trying to do some preemptive maintenance on certain things or... Um, I think in a couple of those cases, like the, the water pump, we could have taken it to the shop and you wouldn't have seen it. it. It's not evident until it fails. But there may be simple things that we can do for uh, flushing hydraulic fluid or, or checking seals or popping lines on and off to make sure that we don't have degrade on anything like that. Uh, or just simple, simple things about bringing some of the new road crew members up to speed on where to plow, where to do turnarounds, where our, our township lines are, things like that. So I'll... Irene, I know you're usually interested in, in that sort of thing. Jim Brooks, if you'd like to be in attendance as well, I'll keep you informed on when we're going to set that up. It will probably be a Saturday once we have a slightly better weather or no slow, snow out. That way we can take the trucks out and have people drive them around a little bit without any sort of uh, uh, concern for interference on things. Yeah. Just a quick question about yes. what you were just saying. Um, you think uh, at some point we could get the guys together and we could come up with a schedule for on the vehicles. That's something that, you know, we need to make sure is routinely done. I know Butch is like right on top of things, yeah. but, but actually having a schedule, having a book, you know, having people check on, you know, do checklists, run through checklists, mm -hmm. make sure X, Y, and Z is done. I mean, even something as simple as the turn signals, whatever the mm -hmm. case is. I mean, I know I did that when I was in EMS. We routinely check our equipment. Everything's good, go out the door. So... I yep. think something like that, ounce of prevention is always worth a pound of cure. Yep. So. One of the things that I want to include either in the handbook or as a supplementary thing, and we've talked about this in the past, yep. is a run book for the road crew of here's some startup procedures. Like before you go out, make sure that the windshield wipers are in good shape. Make sure your turn signals work, that your headlights are good. Um, when you come back in, whether it's right away or the following day, be sure to pressure wash the truck off so that the salt doesn't sit. Um, routine maintenance things, check the oil. Once, once a month or something like that, and then have a, a logbook of any maintenance that we do. Because the goal here is to not have to take it into a shop as much as possible. Anything that, that we can do to keep the trucks running basic, we do it, but also keep track of that so that we know what's being done and when. So that's something that we need to find a good, a good rhythm and a, a good routine on. But uh, of the, the couple of documentation related things that we need to do like the employee handbook and everything else we just need to, to sit down and, and do it but 
complete and utter agreement on you with with you on that. That would be a very beneficial thing to have. Um, one last comment before I turn it over to Irene. Uh, I also would like to uh, offer special thanks to the farmers, especially Daryl Brubaker, uh, as he did not charge the township for his time or the use of his equipment, and he went out and cleared snow during a couple of the snowstorms. Uh, if you don't have any uh, objections, Irene or Jim, I think we should send uh, cards out to anybody, including our own road crew. Just a, a simple thank you note for all their hard work and, and dedication to helping keep the township up and running during a, a disaster. Peter, if you could send me some sort of a logo. I, yeah, I know. I, I owe you a picture. I have, I have a, I have something I need to neaten up a little bit, but it's the it's something that I had re previously put together for the community association for some of their flyers, where it's the the, the turtle yep. that the, is on some of the patches that's up in the historical thing and it says Marion Township and a, a banner across the middle. Yeah. So if we want to use that, awesome. If we don't, we can find something else, but uh, sure. that has been something better than nothing, but I, I owe you that. I just got to clean it up a little bit. Okay. Yes, yeah, Sue, I'm going to I asked Peter to send me a logo. I'll get up a whole bunch of thank you cards, just kind of generic thank you cards, print it up. We could send them out to people like occasions like this and and, Before you, know, you go buy some, there might be some in the file room. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, blank cards and envelopes. Yeah, but this, like this way, you could have the whatever logo on the front. Yeah, they're completely blank. Oh. Uh, so you could print them. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if we do have those, let's use them first. But if we don't, it's it's not going to be an outlandish expense. And I think that's that's a good. I, I know they're envelopes, and I'm pretty sure they're cards there too. So I mean, okay. not, don't go buy any. Okay. That'd be great. Thank They've you. They've probably been there for 15 years and not being used. So. <laughs> well, let's let's start using them. It's a good professional yeah. courtesy to be in. Yeah. Um, that's the last of my comments, Irene. Uh, do you have anything that you'd like to touch on? Yeah, I do. I just wanted to give everyone an update. I know at the workshop meeting I talked about some uh, financial issues. Um, it seems uh, we were getting charged for a service that we weren't being used, that we weren't utilizing. So the bank's going to be reimbursing us for. Uh, some minor charges that had been going on since November. Um, if the, the another part of uh, the financial planning that I was talking to with Pam over at Fulton Bank, I uh, was talking about ACH payments. And for those of you that aren't that familiar, it's just basically an electronic payment. Um, at first I was like, well, you know, we really don't do, we have some vendors, but we don't have a lot of vendors. But then I just started thinking a stamp is 55 cents. So the ACH payments are based on the amount of transactions we have, and, and they put it through to various companies that do that for us, basically. So Fulton Bank kind of farms it out to somebody else. I'm thinking if that payment, we have to pay for those transactions. If that payment is less than 55 cents, it really does pay for us to start making electronic payments to vendors. So... I think this week uh, or next week or next couple of weeks, I'm going to start seeing who will take an ACH payment um, if that's the case. And then I could get um, a list of people who are willing to accept it. I could then go back to the bank and say, what's the cost? Um, if it's as little as 20 cents per transaction, we're still saving money in stamps. One of the things that you should ask about uh, as a possible alternative to ACH, because ACH is a direct payment. Mm -hmm. Fulton may have a bill pay service where they essentially cut a check on our behalf mm -hmm. and that that may actually not carry a fee of any any variety in it. I don't think that that's the case when it comes to business because she was discussing with me all the options available for municipalities and, and essentially small businesses but I'll bring that up with well, her. yeah and yeah. so if you can get a, a list of the the options for like electronic payment send it my way I'll, I'd be glad to take a look at it with you no no and, no yeah, because she she was just going over everything that they had available, basically yeah. as a municipality. That that wasn't one of the things. That's exactly what I was thinking. But but I'll I'll get back to it. And yeah, because because um, the other other thing to consider is like because I know you were talking about a, a credit card because like right. we, we do actually have yeah. the ability to get a credit card. We would have a a fee-less transaction on our, our side of things by making a credit card payment or setting up a recurring payment to like Comcast and then authorizing the payment of that card at the end of the month. Yeah. So yeah. there's there's a number of different ways that we can slice this, but to your point, it's, it's only 55 cents for a stamp, right. but we mail out a lot of stuff. Right. So that, that adds up pretty quick over the course yeah. of a year. Andy's still with us, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Andy, Let's see. So if we have this direct electronic payment, whether it's through a bill pay program 
or it's through ACH transfer. Once we're at the our meetings, that satisfies that two signature requirement. Is that is that kosher? Is that how this works? Because I know that was a concern, and she was telling me that many municipalities and boroughs go through that. If yeah, it's pretty common. Um, so as far as two signatures, <laughs> I honestly don't know how that. Okay. I, so, there's probably there's two names on the signature card at the bank. Yeah, Andy. Um, I. The last time we talked about this, I think you had mentioned that we would uh, pass we would pass on it as like a, a I can't remember if it was a motion or a, a resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that we would eventually essentially pre-authorize, like if Comcast is always going to be $190 a month, we sign off on that two signatures right up front saying we're going to pay this every month. We're, we're authorizing it to be paid electronically. Right, right. And then at each meeting each month, you will have a list of bills uh, and ratified bills that have been paid since the last month. Mm -hmm. So cool. that was that the I was really concerned yeah. about. So I'll, I'll clarify if we could have electronic bill payments, that's the route we're going to go. But I don't think that that's available to us as a municipality. So and then once we know how many people will accept the payments, and who it is, then I could go back to the bank and then the bank can bid this out essentially. And then we'll know what the cost is to us for each of these payments. So, and, you know, I was like, wow, you know, that, that over time, that does save a considerable amount of money. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether, you know, things that we don't think about the payment for the checks, the envelopes, um, you know, even right now, I hate to say to the ink and, and yeah, I was just about to say ink, stuff. ink is, yeah. ink is not cheap. Yeah. Um, then um, the next uh, part of this is we were talking briefly about when the website is launched. And Sue, I guess this question is more directed to you. Um, you'd be able to give me an idea over whether or not you'd want to accept any payments online. Um, what she also informed me is that you get a detail over over what who's who's getting paid for what so I know you had said you, you're not fond of having like the permits paid online um, but um, if there's any of anything else and this this is this tabled for further down the road because we don't have the website launched yet ideally it would be something much better for the tax collector to have where people could pay their taxes online but again that's something Eileen has to be comfortable with so that's something that that's available in that respect so our Residents can pay certain things online if we choose to do that. So, well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not the treasurer. So, no, 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 no. no. Yeah. But, I think, but, I, but I'm saying I, I'm not. I will not do. I'm not the treasurer, so I am. I don't. Let me just be blunt. I don't want anything to do with the online payment stuff because I'm not the treasurer. No, 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 no. But I know what you're talking about. It's it's matching up the permits with the payments. You know, and we want to make sure that that still stays a very coordinated event. Yeah, that could yeah. get a little, that could get very... Right, right. ugly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we already had one um, that was just very confusing. Right. And, the, and, and that's fine. I have no problems with that. And like I said, you've been, you've been there and, and you know what is going to get sloppy and what's not going to get sloppy. So, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll get back to that down the road if, if that process changes because now we'll have a website and, you know, something about that changes and we're, we're in a better position, whether it's, it's doing the permits online along with the payments, you know, it's a simultaneous type of a thing. That's something that's different, but, but that's just down the road. If there's anything else that you could think that we receive payment for that we could do better with that online, you let me know. I, I, I need your feedback on that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. two, two items we'll for consideration. Yeah. Um, Irene, you brought up one of, the, one of them already, which was the being able to do the permit online. That if you keep, yeah. if you keep the two very heavily connected yep. and you fill the permit out and one of the final steps is I'm submitting my permit, I'd like to pay online right now, or you know, I'd like to mail a check. If you can keep the two of them very rigidly connected, you could have it include a receipt as what it submits into the mailbox or onto the website or something like that. Um, when when you start uncoupling the two, to your point, Sue, that's that's when things start to get a little fuzzy because then sometimes okay, but it's keep like. Keep in mind for permits, like when somebody brings in a permit application, I physically go through that and make sure they have everything that. Yep. You know they have all the papers fill out that they need to, plus a plot plan, plus drawings, plus blah blah blah. 
And if they don't, I say, here, you need to take this back and get them. Right. You know? yeah. So this... you know, if they submit something online, that that could e even just create more of a yeah. No, yeah. Problem. no problem. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we don't we don't have to go down this rabbit hole, but just to play yeah. devil's advocate, this could be a situation where it might be applicable for certain things. We obviously don't want people putting in like a, a permit to build a house like that, but it, it, simple things like a fence permit or something like that might be a little, well, a little I more personally cut and dry. Think if you're going to do it for one permit, you're going to do it for all permits, or you're not going to do it for any permit. Uh, yeah. Because it gets too confusing for people. Nope. It yeah. gets too confusing for people. Yeah. yeah. And for, for, for clarity, this is this is a complicated thing. This is not something that like I'm I'm throwing in there lightly, but it is something that is worth talking about, it's worth considering. Yeah. Um yeah. simply because there's a number of limiting factors and constraints on complexity, but the, the simple reality is to take an online payment if somebody's doing it by a credit card, there's usually a three or, or four percent fee that goes on top of that. So we would either have to absorb that or we'd have to to get that built in and clearly defined as like, yes, the permit right. fee is fifty dollars cash or fifty three dollars or whatever it is for uh, right. if you're making a credit card payment. So there's there's a number of complex things there, but I think the biggest the biggest step forward in the right direction is having a website where you can go. I want to get a permit, and the form is there that you can print it out or fill it out as a PDF and then print it yourself. Like that's. Right. That's the that's the first step in the right direction. Right. So no, I mean, and and I just want to throw it out there because again, I'm used to processing the monies and processing where the things go, but the the whole intake aspect of it too. So that that's all you. And so I wanted, you know, if there's anything else that you could think of that we possibly could accept that wouldn't have that complexity. You know, just let me know. But that's something for further down the road if it's something that you think about. Why couldn't we accept yeah. the pump out? on that there you go we could yeah i we mean absolutely that's could. a straight you know yep. Yep. Fee. it's not different for each person it's yep same yep. fee for every single person yeah, and then the, one of the nice things about that is it could be part of a standard form. So unlike what some of the things that we've seen with SEO work in the past, where like oh great, what what address does this actually go to? You would be required to put in like your name, the property address, the billing address, and you'd have a pretty tight control around. You didn't fill everything out. You can't hit. You can't hit submit. Well, I think um, that'd be something worth talking to Alan about because yeah. he's the expert on this. Nobody yeah. else is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's okay. let's make a, a note of that, and when we talk to Alan, we'll talk about that too. Like, obviously, good old pen and paper works, but if we're if we're going to leverage technology here, is there something we can do that's going to make everybody's life easier or his yeah. life easier as we try to move through yeah. this process? Actually, a lot of people like the convenience of paying online and are willing to pay a four ninety five, three ninety five, mm -hmm. five ninety five fee. I mean. I, I've had to do it myself, and, and just sometimes it's just click of the button, we're done, move on. Yeah, but, yeah, but you, you, like I said, Sue, you're the one that, that are, is way more familiar with all the paper that comes in. I didn't even think about the SEO pump out fees, but yeah, that that's great. Like you said, that that's standard for everyone else, for everyone. So um, if I could have just a few more minutes of everyone's time, I apologize. Um, credit cards, credit cards was, was a, a really nice nice conversation. No personal guarantees. It has nothing to do with you, your credit history. We get people who are authorized users. Um, and what I would incorporate that is every year that that is um, part of the, the, the first meeting of the year, we authorize whoever's going to use it. Meeting minutes goes over to the bank. They have to go and sign for it, but it's not, there's no personal guarantee. We just have to decide how many cards and who we want the cards for and establish a, a policy. So if someone needs to make a purchase, one of, let's say road, road crew guys, we have a limit on that card, goes out with the guy, they, or I should say maybe lady in the future, um, they go out with the card, they make the purchase, they bring the receipt back, the card comes back, the card gets put back in the safe. And I think that's like probably the best procedure to handle that. And so the receipt gets filed and we know exactly what's what. Also having the, the credit card payment come out automatically. Um, again, this way there's no late fees, there's no nothing uh, associated with there. Again, it's just determining who um, will, uh, who and how much will be authorized to use the cards. 
Um, and again, that is something once we decide that, we go back to the bank, let them know what we want to do. Then they could tell us what benefits we could get. There's there's 1% cash back. There's all kinds of things that, that we would be eligible for. They have to process us and, and see what kind of collateral we have. It's just like a um, credit check, except it's it's through the township. So I like, I like that a lot. The other thing she mentioned to me also, and this is the last topic I have, is if we do want to take out loans. So I know last, uh, during the workshop meeting, we talked about Salt Shed. We talked um, about some projects that we would like to plan down the road. And she said, again, something like that. They're willing to do financing. There's anywhere from five to 20 year. It's bringing plans in and um, having them put it through their underwriters and getting back to us with numbers. So um, whether it's a leasing of a vehicle, purchase of a vehicle, or putting up uh, like a salt shed or possibly a uh, pole barn, they're, they're very willing to work with us because everyone likes to take our money. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No, thank you. It was great. Jim Brooks, do you have any comments? Well, I just, I want to add my thanks to uh, Irene and Dan and Sue for getting our books back in order after inheriting quite a situation of, uh, of it being an issue. Um, you've done a great job. And also want to add my thanks to the road crew. They did a fabulous job based on the fact that uh, they had limited equipment with all the breakdowns that we had. And uh, I think they did a great job. And I also want to just add my thanks to uh, Jim McCarthy and, and Andy for the support that they provide us. You know, they're invaluable and you guys are, are appreciated. Thank you guys. Uh, Andy, do you have any comments? Um, no. Jim, thank you very much for, for that comment. Um, yeah, well, I don't hear that. I don't hear that. <laughs> it's great. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, but no, I don't have anything. Uh, I don't have anything else. Okay. Thank you. Jim McCarthy, do you have any comments? Uh, nope. Just thanks again, Jim, on that. Like Andy said, we don't hear that a lot, so it's nice to hear. <laughs> um, usually we get yelled at. <laughs> there's always Maybe somebody. Next time. There's, always, there's always somebody that doesn't like whatever we make people do. So, uh, nope. I will reach out to Wilmersdorf and Tim, and I will, uh, I will circulate back with everyone on that uh, okay. here next week. Thank you. I look forward to hearing about that and the, the kind of rough pricing on the, the couple of road projects, the the culvert and the uh, the resurface for Sheridan, or not Sheridan, excuse me, Stouchburg Road. The, the resurfacing for Sheridan you'll have tomorrow. I okay. already emailed that to somebody they're working on it tonight. Okay, fantastic. Well, in that case, uh, Sue, do you have any comments? Um, just that I got several compliments from residents about the good job our road crew did during the snowstorm the end of January. And we got a complaint form uh, about a fence that was not, that was installed without a permit. Um, and Craft Codes has been notified about that. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, if we don't have anything else, I'll, I'll make a, a motion to adjourn the meeting. The time is now 8.29 p.m. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Stay Thank safe. You. And uh, Thank you. see everyone at the, the workshop meeting. All right. Have a good night. Take care. Bye.